Hello everyone, this is Zerus Trivia, and today we're continuing our Ma Chao Rebellion series with episode 3, titled The Siege of Ji. Now last episode, we mentioned how Cao Cao was forced to turn his attention elsewhere, as another rebellion started in Hejian. This gave both Han Sui and Ma Chao the opportunity to lick their wounds and recover. But with Ma Chao no longer trusting Han Sui, the two of them went their separate ways. So at the start of this episode, we'll first focus on Han Sui, before returning our story to Ma Chao. Now after the defeat at the hands of Cao Cao, Han Sui retreated north into the Luoyang commandery, as he would take refuge with the Di nomadic tribe in the area, as he was on relatively favorable terms with them from their past dealings, and for the time being, Han Sui took no farther rebellious actions against Cao Cao, as Han Sui was already pretty advanced in age at this time, being 67, but unfortunately, Ma Chao continued his rebellion, forcing Cao Cao to finally start executing their family members in Ye in May of 212. And not only was Ma Teng, his son Ma Xiu, and Ma Tie all executed, Han Sui's son and grandson, along with all their extended family members, totaling well over 200 people, were all killed by Cao Cao. The only person Cao Cao did not kill was Yan Xing's father, as he would write a letter to Han Sui, informing him exactly that, as Yan Xing was one of Han Sui's top generals, and Cao Cao wrote in the letter that the government cannot pay for Yan Xing's father's retirement forever, hinting that if Yan Xing does not prove himself loyal to Cao Cao by betraying Han Sui, then his father was bound to die next. Clearly, Cao Cao knew Yan Xing was a filial pious son, but at the same time, any sort of divide, even an imaginary one between Han Sui and Yan Xing, could be an advantage for Cao Cao. And knowing this, Han Sui tried to return the favor, as he would force Yan Xing to take his youngest daughter as wife as a mean to tie him to himself, and force Cao Cao to make good on his threat of killing Yan Xing's father, which would certainly drive Yan Xing at least away from thinking about joining Cao Cao. Now, Yan Xing did not want to marry Han Sui's daughter, nor did he want to rebel against Cao Cao in the first place. So by 214, when the opportunity presented itself, Yan Xing gathered up troops loyal to him and rebelled against Han Sui. And even though Han Sui managed to defend himself as he survived this attack, Yan Xing managed to escape from Han Sui's camp as he would run off to join Xiao Hou Yuan at Chang'an in order to save his father. Now you might not know much about Yan Xing, but just know that he was quite the fierce fighter in his youth, as when Ma Chao was just a teenager, there was several misunderstandings between Han Sui and Ma Teng, leading to feuds and battles between the two sides, and at the time, Ma Chao had challenged Yan Xing to a duel, which resulted in Ma Chao shattering Yan Xing's spear, but at the same time, Yan Xing almost managed to use his splintered spear shaft to cut open Ma Chao's neck. And following Yan Xing's surrender to Xia Hou Yuan, Xia Hou Yuan will eventually be able to put an end to Han Sui in May of 215, as their forces would strike Han Sui at a Qiang village while Han Sui was recruiting tribal troops from them. Although there are conflicting reports of how Han Sui died, with some records indicating that he was killed in this battle, while others have him escaping only to die of old age soon after, at the age of 70. But regardless, Han Sui would die around May of 215, ending the life of this lifelong Xidang rebel at the hand of Xia Hou Yuan's troops. Now that we have wrapped up Han Sui's fate, we need to rewind all the way back to the coalition's defeat and follow Ma Chao's storyline. As we mentioned in the last episode, following their defeat at the hand of Cao Cao, Ma Chao actually managed to receive reinforcements from Zhang Lu. Well, it does seem a bit weird that Zhang Lu would come to Ma Chao's aid, but in a sense, it was Ma Chao's rebellion that had halted Cao Cao's initial plan to march on Hanzhong. So one could argue that Ma Chao's rebellion did in fact protect Zhang Lu, and by supporting Ma Chao to continue his rebellion, Zhang Lu was in fact protecting himself. So with 10,000 fresh troops under the command of General Yang Ang joining him, Ma Chao started phase 2 of his rebellion. 
And without a coalition weighing him down, and without Cao Cao in the Liang province, Ma Chao confidently targeted the provincial capital city of Ji. Now defending the city was the prefect of the Liang province, Wei Kang. And as we mentioned many times before, Ma Chao and the Xidang forces, while experts at horseback archery and open field battle, they are terrible at sieges. So the only thing Ma Chao could do was surround the city and hope to starve them out. Then for the next three months, from January of 212 to March, the city held and waited for reinforcement. But unsure if Xia Huoyuan even knew they were under siege or not, Wei Kang decided to send out his advisor, Yan Wen, to secretly run out the city by swimming from the river that ran through the city. And after sneaking out in the middle of the night and swimming for the entire day, Yan Wen thought he was safe when he climbed ashore, only to be discovered by Ma Chao's scouts. Captured and brought to Ma Chao, Yan Wen was untied by Ma Chao himself as Ma Chao told him that the outcome of the siege is clear. And with no reinforcements coming, please be reasonable and come with me to the city walls and tell the people inside that there is simply no hope and ask them kindly to surrender. Agreeing with Ma Chao, Yan Wen rode up to the city walls as he would scream to the guards inside that reinforcements will be here in three days, so please hold on a bit longer and never surrender. Furious at his betrayal, Ma Chao would imprison him again as the siege continued, and during this long period, Ma Chao would try many times to persuade Yan Wen to help him. But Yan Wen always turned him down as he laughed at Ma Chao's attempts, eventually infuriating Ma Chao to order for his execution. Then finally, in the fifth month of the siege, News of the siege finally reached Xia Houyuan, and this is when Cao Cao finally decided to execute Ma Chao's family members in Ye, as Ma Chao's continued rebellion would no longer be tolerated. Then Cao Cao ordered Xia Houyuan to march out to break the siege and protect the city. But by the time Xia Houyuan was able to organize his army and march to Ji in August of 212, the city had already surrendered after running out of food after an eight-month-long siege. The prefect, Wei Kang, opened the gates and surrendered to Ma Chao, only for Ma Chao to order Zhang Lu's general, Yang Ang, to kill him for resisting for this long. And with Ma Chao in control of Ji, his scouts would soon spot out the approaching Xia Huoyuan army, who was still oblivious to the turns of events at Ji. Then in a location just 200 leagues south of the city, Ma Chao's forces would ambush Xia Huoyuan's marching army and completely shatter them, as Xia Houyuan barely escapes back to Chang'an. Now with no Cao Cao's forces capable of withstanding against Ma Chao in the Liang province, many neighboring commanderies surrendered as more and more nomadic tribes also joined up Ma Chao's ranks, and for the moment, it seemed like Ma Chao had successfully taken control of the entire Liang province, as he would reward himself with the titles the general who conquered the west, the supreme military commander of the Liang province, and the governor of the Bin province as he thought to expand his control eastward towards the Xihe region. However, despite this, the biggest threat to Ma Chao's rule would come from within the city itself, as there were many former officials of the former prefect Wei Kang in the city of Ji that would band together to plan a coup to stop Ma Chao. Headed by the former inspector of the Liang province, Yang Fu, who never wanted to surrender to Ma Chao in the first place as his clan had sent over 1,000 members to the front lines during the initial eight-month-long siege. But despite his pleas, the former prefect did surrender the city. And this led to the arrest of Yang Fu's cousin, Yang Yue, who had been the lieutenant guarding the main city gates. Disappointed and depressed by this result, Yang Fu resigned from his post as inspector and used the excuse that he needed to go back to his hometown to bury his wife. But in reality, Yang Fu was meeting up with his cousin Jiang Xu and their former colleagues in Jiang Ying, Zhao Ang, Yin Feng, Yao Chong, Kong Xin, in addition to outside help from other commanderies such as Wu Du's Li Jun and Wang Ling, An Ding's Liang Quan and Nan'an's Zhao Heng and Pang Gong. Together, the twelve of them plotted to first lure out Ma Chao out of the city of Ji, before shutting its gates on him forever. 
So in September of 213, roughly one year after Ma Chao had taken control of the Liang province, Yang Fu and Jiang Xu started a rebellion in the nearby city of Lu. Then Zhang Heng and Yin Feng, who were both still working in their former roles as advisors, advised Ma Chao to head out and put down these rebels in person. And after Ma Chao had marched out the city, Liang Kuan and Zhao Heng snuck troops into the city and took control of the city of Ji, as they shut its gates and killed off Ma Chao's remaining garrison, and even targeted Ma Chao's family, including Ma Chao's wife and kids. Upon hearing this, infuriated, Ma Chao tried to turn back to attack Ji, but with no means to siege the city of its sides, Ma Chao turned his army to the city of Li, where the Jiang clan lived. So, to return the favor for killing his entire family, Ma Chao killed the entire Jiang clan in the city of Li, including Jiang Xu's elderly mother, who is also Yang Fu's aunt, as it was through her that the Jiang and Yang clans were related. And seeking revenge for her death, Yang Fu led their forces out to fight Ma Chao on the field, as he and six other relatives would ride up to duel and challenge Ma Chao, Yet the seven of them combined could not outduel Ma Chao, as Ma Chao would end up killing the other six relatives outright, with Yang Fu escaping with five major wounds, only to die not long after. But the city of Ji was lost forever, and with news of Xia Huyan's army rapidly approaching to protect the city from another prolonged siege, Ma Chao was forced to turn and run as his forces headed south as he would seek refuge with Zhang Lu with the hopes of borrowing some more troops from Zhang Lu so that he can return one day to Liang province and reclaim what is rightfully his. And with this, we're going to end our episode here as Ma Chao is ousted from the Liang province, and the second phase of his rebellion will end with him losing his entire clan, both from his father's execution in Ye by Cao Cao, as well as the death of his wife and kids in Ji after being tricked by the former officials of the Liang province. And for those Dynasty Warrior fans, one of these officials, Zhao Ang, is the husband of Wang Yi, and their son Zhao Yue was serving as a hostage in Ma Chao's army at the time, and when Ma Chao had heard what happened to his family, Zhao Yue was also killed. But unlike how Dynasty Warrior portrays how Ma Chao wronged Wang Yi, Wang Yi clearly knew their actions would cause the death of their own son, and if anything, they killed way more members of Ma Chao's family before Ma Chao even harmed their son. This is also the reason why only Ma Chao and Ma Dai ended up joining Liu Bei in the end, as Ma Dai was the only one who was serving in Ma Chao's army when they were tricked out of the city of Ji, as the entire Ma clan, also numbering well over 200 people, had died during the span from May of 212 to September of 213. So hopefully you all enjoy this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!